nothing like a matcha moment i'm drinking tea in the tea room <laughs> that part was so weird it was really giving get out vibes Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. Today we're discussing Atlanta season four, episode 10. It was all a dream. I swear I can never say that lyric without trying to imitate Biggie. As per usual, Atlanta does what it does best, which is pay homage to hip hop culture, what it means to be black and everything in between. So let's get into this episode. Share your thoughts with me down below and let's go. Okay, so what we're gonna do is break this up into two plot lines. Plot A is Darius, plot B is Earn and Al. But before we get into that, Let's just start with the introduction. We open up to hearing this very dreamy song and the lyrics fit perfectly for what happens from beginning to end. We see Darius on the couch, which is so quintessential for Atlanta. You remember that couch that they used to chill on back in the day outside. I'm feeling this, except the part of Judge Judy, because my grandma loves some Judge Judy and every time growing up she'd have it on. I'm like, grandma, this is not real life. She's like, yes it is. Judge Judy and Maury, Judge Joe Brown, you couldn't tell my great grandma nothing. Seeing this scene, I'm like, how old is this episode? Is it a rerun or what? Also, it's looking quite pixelated for being on Paperboy's nice TV, but hey. If this is your first time watching me, you should know I'm legally blind. I can't see well, so a lot of times I try to see too much to make up for it. So if I read into things too much, let me know down below. Ern passes the screen to sit down. We see Al making a smoothie, which for me, I just find that so funny. The episode gets even funnier when they're trying to guess what Darius's Depp sesh means. When Ern says, is it a compilation of all of Johnny Depp's videos? And Paperboy says, Says, is it a deputy picnic where do you get this stuff from i love how they both simultaneously said i was closer <laughs> this is where the plot diverts and usually i would do plot a first but we're going to talk about al and Ern first they pull up to an old blockbuster they're going to support one of van's friends who's opening the first black sushi spot in the a i fell out this entire scene first of all when they talked about that Popeye smell, I felt them. There's a Popeye's a couple blocks away and sometimes when I'm coming home, the smell, the whiff I get, makes me wanna do things I shouldn't do. Cause I'm not big on takeout, but the smell of Jollibee's or Popeye's every time. So I felt paper bore when he looked over there and he's like, can we just, are you sure, can we? I'm not really big on sushi. I love sushi, but the smell of Popeyes like no other. Let me know if you're the same, but I tried to savor every second of this episode. I was reading way too much into every single scene when they're going back and forth and people were always like, wait, isn't this an old blockbuster? I read it on a different level. I was thinking how it's very rare that you see a black establishment from the bottom up. Like usually we'll take over something that's been left, like a blockbuster, something that was once successful that is no more and we'll try to repurpose it to do something with it. That is the culture. When you think about soul food or music or fashion, we always have a way of putting our twist on it and we take adversity and we make the most out of it. So maybe they didn't mean to symbolize all of that from the fact that the sushi spot was now where a blockbuster used to be and they didn't even bother really getting rid of the sign, but hey, that's how I read it. When they get in and Ern kisses Van, I get all the feels that I got a couple episodes ago. And then Paperboy has to be the one to struggle to get into the booth, had to, had to. <laughs> I was also laughing when they were still at the house and they started saying E-I-E-I-O and they were going off the top and I was like, you know what? That's not bad for Paper Boy. I always said he was a bad rapper, but I wasn't mad at those lyrics. So back to the sushi scene, I've always had a tri-tiered theory. The first of the theory is that the layer is what we see. It's just the episode as they give it to us, the wild, wonderful, wacky world of Atlanta. The second tier is the commentary and the culture. They always have something to say. It's almost like PBS, but not as boring. Actually, I like PBS, I can't even lie. Let me not throw shade, but you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you watch an educational show or channel and you know you're learning. Atlanta is always mixed the medicine with the foods so that you find yourself Googling and learning things that you never meant to. And then the third tier that I feel like every Atlanta episode has is this mirror reflection. Either they make a mockery of themselves, so Atlanta as a show, or it's a mirror reflection on ourselves where we've been kind of nostalgic with it, also how we've grown, what the show has shown us about ourselves. So using this tri-tier theory, I was watching this scene and trying to read into it on the levels. To how well done this restaurant was, but it wasn't missed on me that they were the only people in there. There was more staff than there was guests, and that's never a good sign. 
when they start to get the dishes and then Van says, well, this is why my back is facing this way. I'm tempted. <laughs> I thought that was so hilarious, but also so Van. They're just so extra, but it's so realistic at the same time, especially these three characters going out of character to try something new but to support another black entrepreneur, it really said so much without saying too much. <laughs> what really had me though was when the guy brought the beautiful white teapot and he said, would you like some hot white Hennessy? Al had enough. He became paperboy real quick. He's like, I'm going to the washroom. He left for a really long time. They were trying different dishes. None of them were hitting. I'm sure you peeped it too when they made a comment about the guy in the back with his bare hands making sushi like where they do that at. And I'm thinking, have you guys never had authentic sushi? Maybe they only ever got supermarket sushi because I've seen them wear gloves there and it's usually cold. But the comments they were making, I'm like, that's how sushi's supposed to be. It's supposed to be room temperature. The rice is supposed to be hot because it's not in one of those refrigerators at your local grocery store. And they make it with their bare hands in front of you. They wash their hands, of course. So all of the things they were saying just let me know that they hadn't had an authentic experience and they were judging it. When chef Kenny comes out and it's almost like he's omniscient with it like he heard everything they were saying like that boot like Tyler Perry it was so funny that he called out everything they said and he said you know I studied this art I went to Japan do you know that the best Japanese restaurant is one that's connected to a subway I think that showed the contrast of how cultures appreciate cuisine differently. Some cultures are more open to going to the hole in the wall and appreciating something because it comes from the culture. But as you may know, there's this stat that's out there that every other culture, their money circulates five to seven times before it leaves their community. The black community is the only one where if at all does it circulate once before leaving the community. And we see this with the commentary they've made on Nikes with the shoe man or when they talked about Nando's in Europe. There's so many examples throughout this series that have shown us that we don't give back to our own community. And when Chef Kenny was speaking off the top about not getting the respect because he's from Alabama or wherever he said he was from and then speaking on trust and we don't trust Chicago men because of this or LA men because of this or New York dudes because of this. I felt that and I shouldn't feel that. I'm Canadian, I shouldn't know all of the stereotypes that we have against our own and how we're so unwilling to support our own. That's how you can read this episode as he's just teaching and putting us on game in this soliloquy without being boring because it was very dramatic for no reason. But then also is this Atlanta speaking on itself. This show has been far from paddleable at some times, and that's why season three got so much slack. I personally loved it. I can see why and understand why a lot of people didn't, but when you look at this series in its entirety, it gave us a lot of what we weren't used to in a form that we weren't used to. When have we ever seen four stereotypical characters encapsulated in this way? Not really seen a Darius, I said that before, and I'm always gonna say that, but we've never seen it in this way. So in a way, Atlanta's been our sushi and I know they meant to symbolize that. So we're gonna go with third tier deeper. And the way I looked at it as a lot of times in our community, we don't go outside the box. We're not outside of our comfort zone. We go across the street to the Popeyes, literally and figuratively, because that's what we know. When Chef Kenny pointed out that that's the next generation and you see kids twerking outside of Popeyes and how it's owned by an Italian guy, spitting facts and truth all at the same time in such a humorous way. No other show can do it better. I'm sorry that it's dark in here, it's about to rain. Even Mother Nature is sad that this show is done. So where were we? Where were we? Oh, the last thing they need to try is the blowfish. And this is after Chef Kenny talks about Queen and Slim being the only time they were rammed and it was only for 15 minutes. They picked Queen and Slim intentionally. When I think of Queen and Slim, which I never watched because I heard that it was basically trauma porn, can I even say that word on YouTube? I don't know what I can say these days. But when I heard of the plot, I'm like, ah, you can miss me with that. But then I started to think about all of the shows and movies that we consider part of the culture, whether it's black romance, black horror, black this, black that, even black history. Everything is drenched in trauma and just showing us this side of who we are that's not all that we are. How often do we get to see opulence? I think now by design, I'm realizing why they put so many allusions to Black Panther in there, where we get to see our powerful selves, even with the woman king coming out this year. And this is another reason, side note, that I wish that they did a season five. If my reading is right, 
They drafted these episodes back in 2019, which is why a lot of times if you get your Googles on, you'll realize they're talking about real life weird news stories from back then. I wish they could have done one more season because I'm greedy, but also I would love to see what they would say about what we've lived in the last year and a half. And a lot of pop culture has shifted and is more aligned with Atlanta. But back in 2016, this was the only of its kind. And that's why it'll always be one of my favorite shows. Back on track with the plot. I'm going to be all over the place like this episode, okay? Forgive me. We have our three characters really in eminent danger because this guy is taking everything way too personal. Even Paperboy, you know, he realizes and he rationalizes with the guy. I felt it when he said that we don't trust ourselves. I feel like he was speaking specifically to Paperboy, especially with what we saw last episode. Paperboy could have been honest and vulnerable with his cousin, but instead he just played it off and they kikied, which was fine with me. But now looking back, it's like, yeah, Paperboy has real trust issues, even within his family. Of course, the show is always on one. This is when Darius to the rescue comes in, punches a guy, rescues him in a pink Maserati. They do donuts in the parking lot. They have Popeyes and they're so elated. The facial expressions are just a bliss. I was here for it. I would, I would be excited for some Popeyes after that. And when they get back to the house and earns like this food tastes so much better when you think you're going to die. Can't relate, but okay. Then they asked Darius, wait, where'd you get the car? He said, I took it from valet, which, hey, is a call back to an earn an hour. Like, how is this valet if I give them the keys after I park? Make that make sense. I'm thinking at this point, this is all a dream, but we'll get into it when we get into Darius's plot. What really got me was when Van is like, you're not dreaming. Ern's like, yes, you're really with us. He's like, nope, I'm still dreaming. He was perfectly contented with it. That's when Al says, I'm gonna go out and smoke. Who wants to come? And they all go out and he's like, I'll be out in a second. Did you peep that when Paperboy I think he tapped his shoulder or walked past him. You could hear the knocking above, the same knocking that made Al leave his house that day in the Crank That Killer episode. So I think that's an allusion to certain moments always being a dream, but we're not realizing it until now. I think that knocking is like a knock to let Darius know that he has a couple minutes left in the pod. And maybe that knock that happened when Al left that day was the same kind of knock. Because remember... Let me not get ahead of myself. I'm going too far too fast. They're outside and you feel all the feels because you know there's only a couple more minutes of this episode and then that's that on that for the series. And we see Darius look at the screen and watch Judge Judy and I'm not about to do what I did when Inception dropped, which is spend two years of my good life trying to research and find was it real or not? We're not doing that. We're gonna get to my theories about that at the end, but my theory is not that it was all a dream. Let's loop back to Darius's plot. He goes to the pharmacy and he asks for a prescription under the name Eze, which is a Nigerian surname that means king. How fitting. But it also is spelled E-Z-E, not like the rapper. I, I got a little laugh out of that. As he's waiting, he sees a beautiful spirit, as he says, and they talk back and forth about anxiety. And I was really thinking, I was like, there's no way he takes anxiety medication, but then that would explain why he's always calm, cool, and collected no matter what goes down. But something just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like it was his prescription. And the girl goes in the back to find it. Looking back, now I'm thinking it's because the prescription is old and it hasn't been filled out, so she pulled it back up. So while we're waiting for the prescription to be filled, he chats with this girl, and it's not like a small talk kind of chat. They're talking about real ish, and I'm here for it because I hate small talk. As they're going back and forth, I loved it. What I loved most of all was when he thanked her for being a beautiful soul. Have you ever had a moment where you spoke with someone just off the cuff and they just exuded a beautiful energy? I love that he thanked her for that moment and it just really spoke to both of their characters. When I looked up on IMDb, it said her name was C-H-E-E, Chi. Not sure if that's the right person. I tried to zoom in on the picture and I still couldn't see well. <laughs> Back on track with that. Another notable moment in this scene was when he was telling her his hack for being in the sensory deprivation pods is to think of Judge Judy because she's thick. I Googled that real quick and there's actually pictures of Judge Judy thick. So I don't know. That's actually a real thing and I don't know why or how. But anyway, I don't know if that really speaks to him being able to discern or if he should have picked the spinning thing like an exception, but whatever. Next scene is he's walking and then someone pulls up by the name of London. She's giving old flame energy. He says where he's going. She says, well, come in the car. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you basically. And I love their back and forth. It's very nostalgic, but there's something just there. And when I think about it, 
it definitely feels like a lost love type of situation. He asked for a little bit of water. She said, eh, I water. That's vodka. She's a wild one. Offers him some weed and he says no initially. And then he says yes. And this is the moment where I realized he's already in the pot. If you remember in season three, he was so religious about not mixing when he took the space cookie. There is no way he's going to play that way if he's been going to the depot pods once a week. No way. So I already knew he was on one. He was in there already. Then things get real wild when she gets stopped. She chugs a vodka to prove to the cop. So extra. But passes the test really, really well. And then she has to go and teeth his gun, run, try to get away, runs over someone, and then says, you caused this. She runs off. He's left holding the gun, pun intended. He wakes up jolted. And then that's when the man... <laughs> To read into this a little bit, I think what happened was they were having fun and something went down. I don't think she's alive. I think something happened to her and he's going through this session and reliving the remorse and the regret. It is a spiritual cleansing. And anything that involves cleansing spiritually is not easy. The first couple goes through are going to be rough for you. Even when you start to meditate, most people can't meditate right away. It takes you a while to get used to being still with your thoughts. You don't have to erase them or clear your mind. You just have to be present with them. And it's so hard because we're not used to it. So when you first start doing things like this, it ain't easy because you're really going through it before you get in the clear. When he's having this moment of reliving the trauma of maybe letting down this lost love or friend, I was like, yeah, this is your first session. And then what also got me was he was left holding the gun. So I'm wondering whatever they went through, he feels responsible for it. And that's why that symbol's in his dream. He wakes up jolted and frantic and I jumped back. I was honestly scared a little bit. When the guy's like, would you like tea in the tea room? I said, homeboy, you're still dreaming. Either that or they're really ripping one off of Jordan Peele because everything is super eerie with it. He goes in the tea room and he's met by three white ladies laughing at him. And I think they specifically pick the contrast, if you know what I mean, to contrast how certain ethnicities are used to these experiences. We're looking at them sideways the same way he was. Like, why are you laughing about tea in the tea room? Why are you saying it like that? But in their world, this is normal. He was trying to wake her up that he was already awake because we have moments like this every day where there's experiences that you are new to, that you can't believe are true, but people are part of every single day because they have access to resources most importantly let me tell you i looked up because i wanted to go a couple months ago to do the sensory deprivation and them prices are steep so i'm gonna wait a couple more months before i try but i'll let you guys know maybe i'll bring you vlog style i've had other experiences in my life whether i've sought out chinese medicine or gone to yoga classes or pilates or meditations or sound baths and I am one of few, if at all, the only minority there. And a lot of times, going back to the sushi example, we're not exposed or encouraged to have these experiences that expand us. I love that Atlanta put that in this episode as a way to say goodbye to us and have us realize that in order to grow and expand, we have to have new experiences too. To put it simply, it's just a difference of culture. <laughs> I believe if my memory serves me right, I really wish I could take notes so I could be right with the chronological. This is when he hops a fence, he knocks on a door, and then someone opens with the chain lock still on. It turns out it's his brother, and that's why he got the prescription with the same last name. He offers it to him, the brother seems happy, offers him Jolof, he says he can't stay. Then there's this moment of wanting more time. So he's like, oh, half a half a bowl. His brother says, I'll give you a bowl and you can have half. I thought that was so cute. Then as soon as his brother goes around the corner to the kitchen and you see the last little bit of the robe, I said, his brother's not here. This is another dream. I just felt it. And maybe I felt it because as you guys know, about two weeks ago was a two year anniversary of when my dad passed away. And my grandma also passed away from leukemia when I was 17. So losing family, it really feels different. And you always have these moments where you think, what if, what if I was there? What if I had done this? And him bringing the prescription, that old prescription that wasn't on file, really makes me feel like Darius is trying to right his wrongs during these deprivation sessions. When he looks at the picture and he says, how's mom and dad? And he gets no, he gets no response. He was finding peace in that moment. Even the back and forth about go out with your friends. No, I'm going to be here for a bit. He probably has remorse for being out in the streets when he should have been with his family. But should, coulda, woulda's all gone. And that's the thing about grief. You always come back to these moments. And even in your mind, you try to relive it to find that peace and serenity. 
Let me not get emotional with it. I can't remember if he wakes up again in this moment. I think he does and he wakes up face down and he asks the guy, I'm not supposed to wake up like this. And then at one point he wakes up and he's screaming and no one comes for him. And I'm like, this is mad creepy. But somehow the stories intertwine and he ends up saving Al, Ern, and Van. And then all of that shenanigans happen. They end up at the house. And like I said, he's staring at the screen, smiling. The smile to me made me feel like it doesn't matter either way. Whether he's dreaming, whether someone's knocking on the door for him to wake up, which I think the fact that he was face down one time, I don't mean to get really like dark with this, but I could even theorize that during one of these weekly sessions, he didn't come back. And this is him in a parallel universe or lost in limbo, just having these moments and reliving them. Or since he goes once a week and these episodes air once a week, all of Atlanta was Darius's dreams. Just call the show Darius's dreams. I think that's too easy of an ending. So here's my theory. I think that each of the four seasons were one of the four characters' dreams. First is Paperboy, aspiring rapper, the dream of making it big. Second season, Van's dreams. We see this with Champagne Poppy and Helen and a bunch of other episodes. Third season, I was telling you guys when we went through those reviews that we were living through Ern's dreams whenever we had those one-off episodes. I might've been wrong, but now when we look back, a lot of times when you have a lucid dream, they throw reality in there, or there's something that's on your mind that's present in your subconscious too. So whether it's a poster in the background of Trinity to the Bone that's for Paperboy's return tour or something else that could allude to earn subconscious as a manager or as a cousin or as a father or whatever, I really still believe that season three was reality meets earned subconscious. I'm standing to that. I said it back then, I'm saying it now. In season four, it would be Darius's dreams. A lot of times things happen and he was always fine, calm, cool, collected. And who else would be calm, cool, collected than the one who is dreaming, right? So that's just me trying to take it another level. I could be way off, but in the world of Atlanta, anything goes. I just kept thinking like, why is it only four seasons? They could definitely have done a fifth one or 10 seasons. We would be here for that. I would like a whole BAN season because that network is on one. That's the way I saw it. There's only two people in my life that watch Atlanta. So I'm so grateful that you guys have been able to give me the platform to have these conversations and discuss this. And I wonder if you were to offer anyone one episode to watch of Atlanta to entice them and draw them in, would it be this one? It checks up all the boxes and it really does encompass everything that Atlanta is. A show that has educated as much as it's entertained, that's made you wonder as much as it's made you realize. And it's just wonderful in its entirety. It really is a masterpiece and I'm so grateful we've had this experience. Whatever comes after this, I'm here for it. If you guys get this up to 200 likes, I'll do a season two review. So let me know. But that wraps up season four of Atlanta. I had such a good time doing these videos with you guys. I appreciate each and every one of your comments. It's been so good. I've learned so much from you. I've learned so much from this show. I've had so many laughs and even tears too. So I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. I had a feeling they were gonna do like a dream twist on it, but I didn't figure it'd be like this. And I'm happy the way it was. I would love to go back and see and wonder where the dreams begin and reality ends. But either way, I'm happy and I hope you guys are too. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later. Editing the video you just watched, but I had to stop because you know, I had to go. <laughs> this chicken though.